All right. Hello there. My name is Lucas Stuber, and I'm a speech language pathologist and linguist here in Oregon. Um, every time there's been a new version of iOS that's come out, I've tried to make a video that goes over the new accessibility features. Um, this time I want to give a special little mention to my friends Adler's Voice, who provide voice output devices to children in need, um, as well as the Autism Society of Oregon, who have been kind enough to involve me in a lot of their technology. Um, these are both accessible precisely as they're spelled, adlersvoice.org, as well as autismsocietyoregon.org. Um, I personally uh, am one of four founders of this organization called Give Language, which is designed to assist companies in making educational technology more accessible. So this is composed of speech language pathologists, assistive technologists, and then an occupational therapist, my friends Chris, Pete, and Travis. So you can get a hold of us that way if you have any more questions. Um, and then, of course, you can get a hold of me through LukeStuber.com. Um, and page. I'll provide those details at the end. So this is one of those videos where you can normally skip uh, the first couple minutes. Um, so in lieu of making you sit through the full 30 minute thing, I'm gonna give you um, some timestamps time stamps you can skip to uh, to get the information that you really need. Full of contents. And the reason why is because rather than just focusing on the new features, I decided with this video to give an overview of everything having to do with accessibility in iOS. And the reason why is because I feel like a lot of folks um, aren't familiar with everything that's available. And also because this is a pretty major iteration. There's a lot of changes this time, um, even relative to iOS 9.3, which was the last uh, video that I made, which also had substantial changes. So if you have a specific interest in terms of visual impairment, auditory impairment, switch access, please do feel free to skip ahead to that section. Um, otherwise, uh, listen to me for the whole time. And uh, I am going to run through pretty much everything that we can do um, in accessibility, although I will not dive super deep into what accessories are needed in those things, although I might in a subsequent video um, if there's enough interest. So the first thing I want to show here is the new lock screen. So this is a big change versions of iOS. Um, so when you first started up here, you see you got the time, you've got your background. Um, if you swipe to the, all these different widgets and things that, that come up, you can see that I have a little bit of a solitaire problem. So it's, it's recommending that for me here. And if you swipe to the right, you're able to pull up the camera immediately. Um, now, I want to show you this um, just because it's going to come up again later. And it's been a big change in iOS that a lot of people have been sort of startled by. Um, you also see all my little apps down in the, the home area here, which are things that I frequently access for students, a variety of augmentative communication programs, which is primarily the ones uh, via which I uh, am going to be interpreting the accessibility. Um, on the very right, you'll also see free speech, which I have to plug because I um, had a part in its creation as sort of clinical director of R&D, and I highly recommend it. It's a $10 app. Um, it's, it's really very useful for a variety of purposes. Um, all right, so starting out in the settings here, there's, there's a couple things that are outside of accessibility that I want to show you really quickly that are useful to me and kids. First of all, one thing that I believe in very strongly in augmentative communication is that children have a separate device for communication that is owned by them, right? So this is not something that's passed around the classroom. This is not something that you get out of uh, the AAC app to play a video that they request. Um, really, ideally, it should be dedicated to communication. Um, I also encourage people to add stickers or feathers or nail polish or whatever it might be, help their child to decorate the device if possible so that it really reinforces that sense of ownership. That said, there are some features that are better left um, unused for the most part. One of those is Siri. So if we go in, you can see I have mine turned off. This is the function where you could hold down the home button and then ask questions of Siri. What I've found is that um, children or adults using AAC will sometimes dwell too long on that home button and then end up in this sort of loop where Siri uh, keeps, keeps asking them questions and you know, expecting a verbal response. So in my experience, it's better just to, to keep that turned off. Okay, I also want to briefly touch on the touch ID and passcode piece here. Um, now, I have mine turned off right now, which is a, generally a pretty bad idea. Um, that said, the fingerprint uh, unlock thing does not always work very well for our kids. Um, so I would encourage you to have a passcode. 
Um, I'll delete the, uh, ah, heck, I'll keep the, the one it has in here. And then it's going to ask you for a six-digit passcode. You also can switch it to a four-digit or actually go, um, you know, with a, an alphanumeric, like a name, something like that. Um, I've seen a lot of classrooms where ASC devices are all set to one, three, one, two, three, four, and um, kids figure that out more quickly than you'd think. Um, so I would encourage something that's that's unique. Um, that you know, if you decide that the child should be able to access it, then absolutely by all means make it something that they can remember. Um, if uh, you're in maybe a classroom environment where somebody else might pick up that iPod and try to use it, then you know you might want to have a, a passcode on there for sure. Um, so that's just a quick touch on the passcode piece. Um, we also can set, and of course I don't have one enabled right now, but how long it takes to require the passcode. As a rule, I like to look at something like 30 minutes or an hour, um, just because that's frequently the length of time that an activity, a communication activity would occur in a classroom, which is unfortunate. Really, we want it to be all day, right? And all day at home. Um, but we also do want to make sure that the hardware is protected from theft and these other things. Um, okay. So um, one last thing I want to show you in this, this main piece here. So you can see that I'm logged into iCloud and I ha have all these different things enabled. Um, now we're going to get into restrictions a little bit later and show you how you can turn these off in an alternate way. Um, but one real easy thing to do just to make sure that there's not email going on or there's not calendar notifications or these other things is just to go ahead and go through and turn off um, you know, the sorts of things that you're probably not going to use. Like I don't use my calendar on this one. I don't use reminders. Um, so that's one option. Um, I would encourage you potentially to, oh, look, see now it's saying, do I really want to delete those? Um, keep on, find my iPad, keep on backup and potentially keep on keychain. And the reason why I encourage you to keep on keychain is because that's going to continue to remember Wi-Fi um, passwords that you've entered in. Um, which is important depending on which AAC app you use. There are ones that will use that Wi-Fi to make backups, for example, uh, proloquo to go Avaz, Speak for Yourself, things like that. Um, so I would, uh, I'd keep it on um, just at risk of, of losing your files, although very often the apps uh, require you to manually make those backups, which uh, we can cover in another video um, if, uh, if we need to. All right. So now we're going to switch and actually head into the accessibility piece here. Um, before we actually get into accessibility itself, I want to show you what I was just referring to, which is the restrictions. So if you want to enable these, you can make up whatever password. I'll do one, two, three, four. You got to confirm it. And then we can go ahead and go through and delete everything. So um, Safari, Siri, for example, although I already had it turned off. AirDrop is the ability to share files between iPads. It's kind of irrelevant whether that's on or not. You might want to keep it on if, for example, the teacher wants to send photographs of classmates to the device to load into their AAC app. Um, that's a pretty convenient and easy way to do it. So that's something you can decide case by case or allow the teacher to decide. Um, and then I pretty much always will turn off iTunes Store, installing apps, deleting apps, definitely in-app purchases, um, Bookstore, Music Connect. Um, and the reason why is because if I don't turn those things off, then inevitably I'll get a bill for <laughs> some amount of money, um, particularly as relates to in-app purchases, um, even if you've been real clever about a password. Um, you also can enable uh, ratings um, for a variety of things, movies, books, uh, websites even. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail because typically, um, you know, as, as I said, what I recommend is that the iPad only be used for communication. So it's kind of irrelevant as to whether we restrict access to websites because ideally they shouldn't be accessed anyway. Um, all right. So now heading into accessibility. So there's a whole lot potentially going on here. So the first thing we're going to cover is some things that are designed for visual impairments. So the first one is voiceover. So if I activate this here, um, what I can do is tap one time to select an item. Um, I can double tap to actually activate it. So for example, if I wanted to select voiceover again, I could tap this twice, and now it's going to turn off. Um, I'm turning it back on for one moment. Now, I know you can't hear the audio right now. Um, so there's, I, you know, I, there's a few things that I want to demonstrate that we'll, I'll just have to let you know about. One of which is the speaking rate here. Um, it, it, in my experience, it typically starts out way too fast. 
So I'd bring it down maybe about that far rather than as high as, high as it is. Um, most uh, kids, particularly of the population that we serve, um, need a little bit more processing time in terms of audio than what it gives, um, which is expecting essentially, uh, you know, to be sharing the information with an adult with a visual impairment, but otherwise no disability whatsoever. Um, now, once you have this turned on, for those of you who do need it, I want to show you, you can take two fingers and rotate them. And it's going to let you choose what exactly is going to be read. So is it just headings? Is it individual characters? Is it words? Is it speaking rate um, that's going to be adjusted? Um, containers, which would be, you know, essentially like this whole piece on the right here. Um, that's a little bit complicated from a motor planning standpoint, but there we are. Um, you also can make adjustments to what exactly is on that rotor here, um, which the, the rotor is the term for what I just pulled up. Um, and then this is also where you would enable Braille, uh, excuse me, Braille um, use. Now, this is something that does require um, a special accessory to access. Um, I'm just going to leave it there because there's a ton of options. But if you were to search for iOS Braille keyboard or even Bluetooth Braille, key Braille keyboard, there's a lot of different options that exist. Um, there's also even just stickers that you can purchase online to place on your keys um, to turn them into Braille access. Uh, I put them on my laptop thinking that I would learn Braille somehow by doing it, and it turns out that did not work. So <laughs> I will figure out another way to do that. All right, so staying on the theme of the visual accommodations, I want to briefly touch on Zoom. Um, this is kind of a neat feature that did exist um, in a slightly different form in iOS 9, but they've really improved it. Um, this is something that I have some family members that use pretty regularly. So if I turn this on, you're going to get this neat little window, which you then can move around a little bit by grabbing that small uh, rectangle at the bottom. You can also pull up options that way. But if I take three fing fingers, if I double tap them and then drag in, then I can change the level of zoom. So you can really pull this around pretty well. There's also the option to enable a controller that'll allow you to move it around a little bit easier. Um, another thing you can do is if I go to zoom region here, I'm gonna have to move this out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. We can also go to full screen zoom. So now if I take that, that triple click again, it's gonna zoom in the whole screen. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this. Um, so again, double tapping three fingers will start the zoom. Um, double tapping three fingers and dragging will change the zoom level. And if you double tap again with three fingers, it's going to turn everything off. Um, all right, so I'm not going to go with a whole ton more into the visual accommodations piece. Um, the magnifier is something that's really improved the camera. So you're able to hold it up to you know, something very small that you're having trouble reading and the camera itself will actually operate as a magnifying glass um, with pretty good success, uh, depending on the level of light. Um, display accommodations is something near and dear to my heart. Um, so we can invert the colors um, for certain kids that might have, um, you know, an aversion to the very, very bright screens that we can sometimes get. We also can, you know, rather than fully inverting, we actually, we can adjust the brightness level, which doesn't look like it's going correctly to my recorder there, but it does make it quite a bit dimmer. Um, and then I have a certain type of color blindness called deuteranopia. Um, and it's been a real problem for me in the past with iOS devices because there's certain things granted, particularly having to do with games that I just haven't be able, been able to access. So um, this is nice. Um, sometimes with our kids, it's tough to tell um, whether there's a colorblindness issue. Optometrists can sometimes give that information. Um, but, you know, for yourself, for example, if you do have a colorblindness, you can go online and take any number of the, the free tests and find out if you have protonopia, deuteranopia, or tritonopia, and then the extent to which you are colorblind. Um, and for me, this has made, even at the level of intensity that I had down here, it's made a really huge difference. Okay, so getting out of this, um, still some more visual impairments that are pretty self-explanatory. Larger text, bold text, button shapes can be made a little bit more high contrast as the one up in general there suddenly was. Um, we can increase contrast, we can reduce the overall motion um, in the iPad, which really is a function of when it's when you're choosing um, 
you know, like a folder the way it sort of zooms out or if you rotate the iPad and things move a little bit. Um, I do typically turn this off for the kids that I work with because you never really know um, if there's a, a sensory you know, issue with that motion, you know, alternately, I've had some kids that really enjoy it for similar sensory reasons. So, um, you know, again, that's a matter of judgment. Um, but let's talk a little bit about interaction. So switch control, they have a whole variety of different great options here. So I'm going to say, for example, that I've got, well, it's not going to let me because I don't, <laughs> my switches are all in a box sitting here next to me. But this is auto scanning here. So what you could do is, for example, with a single switch, wait until it selects one of these rectangle areas, hit the switch once, and then what it's going to do, excuse me, is once you've hit that switch, then it's going to allow you to switch, to choose individually between each one of those items in that area. And again, it's not going to allow me to do that with an actual um, switch. But there are some things um, that I really like about what's here now. For example, the hold duration of the switch. So you can set it so it takes a little while upon activation to actually make a selection. Um, I also really like the ignore repeat piece. So both of these have to do with motor planning issues. Either you need a little bit longer touch or you need to ignore you know, many touches in a row um, as a result of Korea or something along those lines. Um, there's also sound effects that can be associated with switch activation. Um, and you can create special gestures uh, with a certain number of switches. For example, um, hitting multiple switches at once might have a special impact um, or something along those lines. But there's lots of different switch manufacturers out there. Probably the most uh, prevalent is Ablenet, um, who makes the Big Mac switch and the Little Mac and a variety of other ones, including a great Bluetooth switch that now connects to the iPad. But there's other companies out there, um, and typically schools will have access to switches. Um, unfortunately, the majority of them are kind of pricey, but there are some less expensive options out there. Um, and again, that's something that we could talk about another time. Um, and then touch accommodations. So I won't turn them on, but let's go through them really quick. This is really similar to what we just discussed about switches. So we have a hold duration option. We have an option to ignore repeated touches. And then we have uh, this tap assistance piece right here, which is great at the bottom, where we can either use the initial touch location or the final touch location as our activation point. So I have many students um, for, for, you know, that will either tap the iPad multiple times for a single selection because of motor control issues who will need greater um, hold duration time conversely um, to activate things or will sort of swipe around because they're not able to be super accurate with the way that they're um, choosing items so we can decide okay is is it where they are finally pulling their hand off the ipad that's the accurate choice the meaningful choice or is it where they start that's the meaningful choice um, and this is great especially for folks that are uh, AAC developers because once upon a time we had to sort of build those into our own apps and now um, not only is it available already through the iOS for AAC applications but it's also available for anything else that um, a child maybe would do um, again I want to repeat that I do prefer that um, communication devices are dedicated solely for communication but very frequently there will be a second iPad um, that is used recreationally or is used to you know, fulfill that choice of a video or whatever it might be. And so you can also apply these accommodations um, to that second iPad so that they're more easily able to access it. Um, variety of other things here that are a little bit more um, context specific. So they have an option here for hearing devices uh, which are Bluetooth enabled that are already designed for iPad. Um, you also can pair non-iPad designed uh, Bluetooth hearing devices via going through just the normal Bluetooth uh, options. We can, you can see uh, the third down on the left. So it doesn't necessarily need to be something that's strictly compatible with iPad. They actually have pretty good, um, pretty, pretty good support of a lot of uh, hearing supports. Um, and then, of course, you can see here that you can you can shift the audio to one side or the other if there is a dominant side that's preferable, whether due to hearing loss or um, some sort of agnosia, whatever it might be. Um, subtitle, subtitles and captioning, audio descriptions, these are pretty self-explanatory. And then I do want to get into guided access. So this seems to be the thing that people understand the least about what they're able to do with AAC or with, with any app, really. Um, but it's also happens to be one of the most important. So just for fun, I'm going to pull up um, 
an AAC app here, and we'll go with um, Avas because that they are my friends. <laughs> Although it's not as common as some others, there's a really easy, quick application that I want to demonstrate here. So the way that you would activate guided access is by triple clicking the home button. So now it's going to give you these options here. So you can turn on or off touch, which clearly in this case we wouldn't want to do. You can turn on or off the hardware buttons. For example, if we want to keep the volume constant, if we want to turn off motion access, which is irrelevant in this case, um, if we want to turn off keyboards, again, irrelevant in this case. Um, but then there are a few little tricky things here that people don't tend to know. So if I take my finger up in the upper right here, there are some options that say edit, settings, help, search, and dashboard. Now within this app and within many apps, you actually can go ahead and disable those and pass, uh, password protect them. But that also often means that a kid will try to access that and it'll prompt them for a password and then they're frustrated because they can't access their device because they're not sure what's happening. So what we can do is take our finger and outline the area that we don't want to be accessible. And then you can see how this grazed it out and I can sort of take these and and set it up. Um, so this is a great way to suddenly block this. You can't see it on the video, but I'm sitting here trying to hit everything, whereas I can go ahead and hit everything else. Um, so that's something that's very useful. Now when I get out of here, it's gonna ask me for my primary password, which uh, I guess you know now because you watched me do it, but that's okay. I, I, I trust you all. Um, another thing that's kind of useful, and we'll go into, um, like, the, there's some sensory apps that I use. So this is a really good one um, called Frax. So there are certain kids who will choose this, especially those on the autism spectrum, um, that really enjoy the sort of sensory experience of the way you're able to, to alter and modify this app. And you can use your finger and sort of spin it around. So if I once again triple click, what I can do is, you know, there's no reason to disable touch. There's nothing I need to block in this app. But what I can do is set a time limit. So we could say, for example, okay, you have five minutes in this and then we need to get back to work. Um, and that's uh, great because when the iPad stops working for this particular app, it takes the agency away from me as the clinician. Um, so if, you know, the child were to get frustrated, um, they tend to get frustrated with the iPad um, rather than at me. Um, but it's also just a nice clear way to uh, set a time limit. Now another thing you can do, we get out of guided access, and this is relatively new also. Um, and it only, this will work on uh, a limited number of devices. So you have to have a, a pretty new um, iPad, but I'll go into a different um, sensory app. This one is called Fluidity. It's another one that I enjoy very much. Um, you can sort of use your finger and adjust this or change the colors, um, another good sensory experience. But if I swipe from the very far right, now you're gonna have this list of apps that come up um, of different things that can run in parallel. And of course, time timer is the one that I'm going to use most frequently. So I can set something like a, you know, a five minute timer, go ahead and hit play. And then that's going to go ahead and give us a chime when it's up. So that's uh, that's another good option for providing a, a really concrete visual. If you do the guided access time limit, there's no, there's no real visual reinforcement. Whereas here you can come over and say, okay, we've got this much time left. Um, and you can, uh, minimize the the display a little bit as well um, or have it even look like uh, the time time timer piece so I'm not meaning to sell you on the app time timer um, but I do find that it's something that's very useful for a lot of my kids and a lot of them are already very accustomed to uh, having that exact visual in their um, in their classrooms so we've touched on guided access um, I do want to point out one last thing is this accessibility shortcut. So right now when I triple click, it's always going to come up with the guided access option. Um, it's not going to do it right now because I'm in the settings and there's really not a reason to lock someone into the settings. But you also can set it up. So say I wanted to add color filters, invert colors, and zoom, and switch control. I'll get rid of zoom. So now if I triple click, 
it's going to give you these options of what you're actually trying to access. Um, so for me, that might frequently be color filters because when I turned on when I turn on the colorblind miss mode, some some kids will say, "Why does your iPad look so weird?" So it's nice to be able to turn it on and off. Um, but that's pretty well it. I mean, there's some pretty substantial changes. I'm really happy with what they've done with switch control. Um, all the visual accommodations are actually fantastic, although it might not always be um, something that we access uh, that much um, in terms of AAC, um, depending on the student. Um, and then I'm also really happy with the touch accommodations because I do have so many kids that um, will have challenges being accurate with their touch on an iOS device. A um, few other things I wanna share really quickly. Um, and I'm going to close everything out here. Um, there's a few other things going on in terms of accessibility. Um, for example, the Apple TV is now also uh, compatible with switches, which is great. Um, so from a recreational standpoint, um, especially uh, given the ability to limit um, kids into family friendly things, it's a nice way to be able to give access to stop and restart and switch between different TV shows without always having to have parent input. Um, there's a variety of other uh, accommodations you can do, um, including voiceover, um, dictation of things, um, or excuse me, of um, of text, and then uh, all pretty much all the same display accommodations that we just reviewed, including Zoom um, and those sorts of things. Um, and then one thing that's real exciting right now is that in uh, Mac OS X Sierra, uh, which just came out um, for the PC, we suddenly have this neat switch control option here. So OS X now can also be controlled with switches, which is the actual Macintosh computer. And the one I'm real excited about is OS X um, support for eye gazed wall control. And they've actually done really a fantastic job with this. Once you enable it, um, you've got a really a great um, series of options in terms of how it should be controlled and at what level of complexity um, really it should be enabled. Um, so I'm glad they're laying the framework for that. We had sort of known as an industry that they had filed some patents in that regard, but we've been waiting for it to happen. So this really has just happened in the last week um, where it's been in beta for some time, but just been released in the last week. Um, there is right now only one uh, company, which is the iTribe, uh, which is making a eye gaze tracker that's compatible with OS X. Um, it's, it's $199 as pre-order, or you can get a development kit now. Um, unfortunately, it's really not completely fleshed out yet, but as you can see, it... Um, it does work. Um, it's a fact it's been working with OS X um, since 2014, um, but really just as sort of a developer trial. I mean, now we actually have support within the... I do want to add that since I made this video, I actually did get uh, eye gaze control um, both for the OS and for communication working with uh, OS X and the iType tracker. Um, so I will link uh, using one of these new YouTube cards uh, to that information at the end of this video. Again, my name is Lucas Stuber. Uh, you can contact me through givelanguage.com or my personal website, lukestuber.com, which I'll type in because nobody can ever spell my last name. Um, and please do contact me if you have any questions. Uh, that would be luke at lukestuber.com. Um, and I encourage you to visit also Adler's Voice and the Autism Society of Oregon because they have some really fantastic resources. Thanks for your time. Have a wonderful day.